That should do. Well, first off, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, just a quick poll. Hands up if you've heard of the Linux Professional Institute before. All right. Well, then I'm glad I'm here. Uh, just a quick background about LPI, as most people know it. Uh, well, first of all, hi. I'm Matthew Rice. I'm the executive director for LPI. I uh, have been for the last three or so years. Uh, I am certified by the organization. That happened while I was still a volunteer. So, yeah, just so you know. Um, the Linux Professional Institute was incorporated as a nonprofit back in 1999. Uh, we do have regional offices in you know, a couple of dozen countries. Um, and in that time, we've developed a track, a graduated track of education standards that people can use to learn how to use Linux in a professional setting. Um, uh, just to pop back to here. This presentation here is going to be very brief because what we use the rest of the time for is uh, an opportunity to dive into some of the objectives of some of the certifications. And it depends on what you guys are interested in, uh, which ones we cover. Right. So it's a very short agenda, right? A little bit about LPI, uh, what exams and certs we have, uh, most importantly, how to prepare for the exam. It's one of our frequently asked questions, not just how to prepare, but how to actually go and take the exam. Uh, for some reason, we make it hard for people. Uh, and as well, if you do go to take the exam, what you should expect. You know, the format, how long the exam is, how many you, you, you need to take, um, and then also what happens afterwards. You know, how you get your results and, and what to expect. Right. Just a standard disclaimer. I might not know what I'm talking about, but until you're certified, you won't know. <laughs> nah, I'm joking. So you learn this stuff. Uh, a lot of people just use our objectives actually for a study guide. Many don't go on to get certified, usually because they're already working in the field and you know they're happy about it, but they want to make sure that they're not missing anything. And for LPI certifications, we sort of cover do the 80-20. You know, we cover the stuff that you need to know daily to do a job using Linux, right? And we, there's no way we could cover everything. So we rely on a group of volunteers around the world, sometimes up to a thousand guys that, and girls, that answer some surveys, tell us how important certain things are and how often you have to use the, that knowledge. And based on that, that's what we use to create the objectives for various exams. So our mission is actually not to be a certification body. Our mission is to try and get everybody using open source everywhere, and not just for prof professional use, but home use, hobbyists, anything like that. Um, oh, they slipped this one slide in. That's why I did this earlier. All right. The other thing about our certifications is they're not tied to any particular vendor. Uh, we do cover the two main streams of distributions, you know, the RPM-based ones and the depackaged ones. So by the time you're finished preparing for this certification, you should be comfortable in both of those environments. In fact, you strongly suggest that you, you use both of them regularly, you know, whether it's Debian or Ubuntu or Linux Mint Debian Edition, which is my favorite, um, or, you know, CentOS, Fedora, SUSE, any of those. Um, we don't cover the GUI parts of configuring a system because, to be quite frank, most of the time you're going to be using Linux on a server or in a virtual machine or using containers. And my personal preference is not to install GUI stuff on those servers anyway. So we do expect you to be very comfortable in the command line. This is a very boring map, but it shows you actually where we 
have at least one certification holder in, in any country. So any country in gold or yellow there, we have certification holders. There's 13 countries so far that we haven't been able to find someone or they haven't been able to find us. But you know, it's the, it's the usual suspects, North Korea, Syria, Somalia, Central Africa. Um, so well, we'll see what we can do. Over the last 20 years, we've had about a quarter of a million people attempt to get certified and 165,000 of them have, have managed to, to pass at least one of our certifications. And we've delivered over 600,000 exams and they're delivered in nine, nine languages and, and growing. Um, I'm hoping this year we'll be adding perhaps Arabic and Korean. Uh, but right now it's English, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Japanese, Chinese, I'm missing one, Italian, um, you know, and, and we'll add more as we can. So one of the benefits about our certifications is they're not tied to a particular vendor or their product. These are skills that if you learn them now, you'll probably be using them still in 10, 15 years. I, I got my level one certification back in 2002 and quite frankly, underneath the hood, except for you know some fun things like system D, if you've heard of it, Linux is still the same Linux it was 20 years ago. Yeah, the other thing is certification is not a panacea. Uh, this is usually a warning to hiring people uh, HR managers, that that sort. Certification is not the absolute proof that you can do a job, right? So it's an indication that they've studied, they've learned more than probably the person interviewing them, and they're you know dedicated to becoming a professional, and they're taking it serious. It is a globally recognized credential. Uh, actually, we do have some partners that use these credentials as a prerequisite for their credentials. Um, I don't have any good examples, I'm trying to think right now. I mean, it used to be SUSE did that, um, Ubuntu for a while, uh, but also some, you know, partners that have open source based products where they have engineers going off into the field. Uh, they're not a distribution, they're just a, an appliance or something. Um, and, you know, they think this is, a, is the appropriate preparation for those engineers, aside from getting training in their products, of course. Uh, we don't man in mandate any particular type of study or method. If you like video learning and you want to go to Linux Academy or Pluralsight or NDG, you're welcome to do that. If you like books, you can do that as well. Uh, if you want to set up study groups, lots of people do that uh, to support each other and encourage each other to continue learning uh, instead of, you know, getting to it later. Uh, and some people just like to print out our check, you know, our checklist for the objectives. Uh, for some of the exams, it can run into six to ten pages of details of exactly what we expect you to know for the exams. We try not to surprise anybody. Um, we tell you exactly what we think you should know and we don't try to trick you with qu tricky answers to the questions. You either know it or you don't and, and we try and keep it fair. Uh, yeah, so this, this is our current track, okay. Uh, we do have an educational certificate. So if you're brand new to Linux, you've never touched even a computer or you've never touched a Linux desktop, uh, we do suggest you take a look at Linux Essentials first. It covers the, basis, the very basics about getting around on the command line, uh, some background about open source and free software. Um, and it's a very gentle introduction to using Linux. Um, we do target it more towards, you know, high schools and universities, um, but also a lot of professionals that are, you know, switching careers will take this as a, 
you know, get a taste of what they're in for. We also find that if you don't have any prior experience to l in Linux, um, it also does improve, you know, how well you do on, on LPIC 1. Right? Um, whether you actually go and get the certificate or not. It's not a requirement. Uh, it's really just to, it's, it's one of our ways that we use to get, you know, Linux and open source education into, you know, high schools. You know, it's, it's some education standards. Just teach this to them, and at that point, they'll be informed enough and know whether or not they want to continue. On the professional track, uh, we have LPIC 1. That's been 1999 or 2000 when it was first launched. Uh, it's now at version 5. Okay, Linux does change a little bit, so every three years, we take a look at how you know, whether it's versions of software or brand new changes, and we adapt the, what we expect you to know. Right. So once you uh, know your system well, then we start getting into other things like network services and uh, at some advanced topics, which is LPIC2. And then we get into the enterprise level, which is mixed environments, mostly a Samba 4 exam at this point, uh, security, enterprise security topics, and one that we're actually breaking into two uh, different certifications later this year, uh, virtualization and high availability. Okay. And two years ago, we also released a DevOps tools engineer certification. Uh, the reason LPIC 1 is not a requirement is we recognize that these tools are not always just used on Linux. So we recommend, though, before you do it, that you're extremely comfortable in your operating system of choice. You know, and then you go and tackle the DevOps topics. And trust me, it's, it's easy to just jump to the fun stuff, which is, you know, the LPIC2 topics and the DevOps. But it means you'll be missing a lot of stuff that you don't know you don't know, which come in very, very handy later on. And keep you, you know, prevent you from becoming a security nightmare as well. So for Linux Essentials, uh, again, this one breaks the mold for our professional track. In this one, it's, it's a 60 minute test and uh, there's 40 questions, okay? If you're prepared, it's plenty of time. I've never seen anyone that's prepared for the exam run out of time trying to answer the questions. And again, it's a completely separate track uh, for, from, from the professional level track. Although some groups do use it for help desk level uh, type jobs where someone just needs to know enough Linux to get onto a remote server, maybe check some logs, run some SU do. Do you guys say SU do or sudo? Sudo? Okay. I don't know why I say SU do. But, well, because I, I call the command SU, right? So it should be SU do. Anyway, all right. We won't belabor that point. The DevOps Tools Engineer, it's uh, exam 701. It's a completely different track from the LPIC ones that we call our open technology track. I don't think there's any slides on it, but uh, later this year we're releasing a BSD Unix certification as well. Um, there is a group that's been going for 15 years or so called the BSD Certification Group, and they've merged their efforts with us, uh, you know, mostly so that we could help them get that certification more broadly available worldwide. And they'll pick one. Each exam is, uh, sorry, I can't see the next slides here. Each exam is 60 questions, sorry, 60 questions, 90 minutes. Um, but for level one, there's two exams you have to take. And we break it up so it's not too much studying at once. You can just tackle half the subject area and then, then you know, get an early win, take that exam if you want, or, you know, continue on and prepare for both at the same time. Level two, the same thing. This one, oh, sorry, I forgot to mention. Again, LPIC 1, you're still on your own system. 
you do set up a few services like making sure that your, your own system always has the correct time, but it's just more things to keep your own server internally uh, managed, right? Then we let you attack the network, right? So some advanced system topics, but also, you know, setting up web services, FTP, DNS, you know, essential network infrastructure that Linux has been doing since the 90s and doing very well. Oh, the other thing I should mention is because this is a graduated certification track, you do have to have your LPIC 1 in order for us to award you an LPIC 2. And the reason is it's a cumulative knowledge stack. And just because you know how to set up an FTP service doesn't mean you know and understand permissions, ownership files well enough to make sure that you're going to be doing that securely. And usually once, uh, unless someone's a dedicated student, you know, if they're doing this during their work uh, life and they're, you know, adding skills as they go, normally it takes about five years of experience or so. Again, depends on the person before they're ready for some of these enterprise level topics. So, how to prepare for the exam. All right. So, uh, again, 90 minutes, 60 questions, except for essentials. And we have two main formats of questions. Multiple choice, believe it or not, it's harder than you think. And each of those multiple choice uh, questions will have four or five potential answers. Uh, you just have to choose the correct one. If there's more than one correct answer, we tell you. Again, there's no tricks. If there's two correct answers in that list, we'll ask you to choose two. All right, if there's three, great. And then we also have the fill in the blank ones. All right, the, the, the answers to the fill in the blank questions are always a technical term or, or file name or something like that. Uh, we do that to make sure that it's easy to translate, because otherwise, you know, written English or French answers, it's, it's tough to, to score automatically. Okay. Now, again, there may be multiple correct answers. You know, if you get a question asking you, a, you know, a basic tar command line, there's usually about 12 to 15 variations that would be acceptable. You only have to put one in. Some people will try to answer, you know, this is the answer and then they'll put a comma or a colon or something and this is the answer and this is the answer. And If you're taking the test through the, through the VUE network, which is uh, regional te uh, local test centers that are set up with partners of theirs, um, don't do that. One thing to know is, uh, it's kind of like that joke, uh, what do you call the guy who finishes last in medical school? Doctor, right? I know, <laughs> it's a bad joke. Hey, I'm a dad. All right, you basically get a pass or fail. We, we do what's called sc uh, scaled scoring, right? So the score is always between two and 800. A 500 is pass. Doesn't mean 50%, it doesn't mean 75% of the questions were right. It depends on each version of the exam that is given because each set of exam questions have different difficulties. All right. So the reason we don't give a percentage is we want you to know that if you take this test and you score 600 and you go and take this, you know, a different version of this test two or three or four months later, you should get about the same score, if not the same score. Again, assuming you didn't learn anything in those last three months that's covered on the test. Right? And we do this so that, you know, you can tell, you know, how well you did relative to the pass when relative to, to be honest, everybody else. Right? We put the 
exam objectives up on our website, but we also have a more uh, printable version that you can get on our wiki. Uh, it's also where we put uh, updates and new versions that are in draft. So if you want to see what's coming, if you're, you know, if you know that we're going to be releasing an update to the exam in three or four months, and you want to see if there's some additional things you should be studying, take a look at the wiki. We'll be putting all the inf we put all the information there. All right. Uh, the other thing is we have versions for these. So right now we're at version five for LPIC one and LPIC two. And if you're going and buying books or anything like that, and you know they're discounted, they're probably discounted for a reason. You know they're back on version four, or version three, and they're the publisher's just getting rid of some stock. Okay. So always double check before you take the exam which version you're studying against. Right. When we do release a new version, we leave a six month overlap so that people that are going through say a high school or university program that's a four or five month semester, they still have an opportunity to take that exam even though they were studying the previous version. Right. But again, Linux doesn't change a whole lot every you know week or month, so you know an old version's still okay. Hopefully you'll take a look at what the changes are between versions. We do print a, a diff for, for everybody so that you can just study the updated materials as well. All right. Uh, the other thing we do, uh, and we'll be doing this, uh, actually, if you want. Oh, never mind. Okay, all right. Uh, the other way we deliver the exam uh, not just uh, at events like Linux Fest, uh, Scale, CBIT, uh, next year hopefully FOSS Asia, um, but we also do this with some partners in, in remote areas where, you know, quite frankly, the test centers and the networks, they just don't have any test centers there. Yeah. But we have some partners that are teaching people there and we'll arrange for them to do a paper version of the exam. The, the only downfall to this approach is that they do have to send the, the answer sheets to us and we scan them in and, you know, score them that way. And so we tell people it'll take, you know, up to a month for them to get the result. It's quite often less than two weeks, but people usually want to know right away. Um, although that's not how it worked for me in high school and university. Um, but, you know, people are used to taking review where you get your score immediately. And uh, yeah, they're disappointed when they find out it doesn't work that way with the paper. To, if you take it through the Pearson View test network, uh, the easiest way to book the exam is just go to view.com slash LPI. All right. Uh, over on the right side of the page, you'll see find a test center. Uh, there are quite a few, there's a few at least uh, here in Singapore. Um, the nice thing about it is they don't have to be a, you know, quite often it's a training company or, or a school uh, will set up a, a view test center. And they actually quite often make it available for any test that views delivering for their partners, you know, whether it's Cisco tests, Microsoft, IBM, ours. Um, most of the tech certifications out there right now that are generally available to the public, they're available through the view test network. So, on exam day, try not to stress yourself out. Rest up before you do it. Don't cram, do any last minute cramming. Never helps. Um, and, you know, dose yourself appropriately with your caffeine and sugar. You know, you guys know all these things, right? Yeah. The other thing you'll have to do is bring some photo ID, all right? You are verified. It has to be something usually issued by the government, whether it's your license or your passport, citizenship card, residence card, anything like that would be acceptable. The other thing you need to know is your LPI ID. It's a, it's a nine digit string and you can get that, oh, 
But you can get that by also just going to lpi.org slash register. And I think it'll redirect you to this one. If you do go to, view, and that's especially important if you come and do a paper version of the exam. Uh, if you go to view and you just take the exam and you just ignore that question because they do ask for the ID, we'll automatically assign you one. So read all the questions carefully, okay? We don't try to trick you, but, you know, sometimes something does look like the correct answer, but it's not. Um, and in my experience taking tests, the first answer I pick is usually the right one, and then I change it and, and get it wrong. Yeah. Um, multiple choice. There's always one correct answer. Again, unless you see in little parentheses, please select X number of answers. For the fill in the blank ones, if, we, if you're expected to know the path to a file or a directory, we'll be explicit and say that. If we, if we just want the command name or an option name, just put that part, all right? People miss this part of the question all the time. I don't know why. And it's uh, and that's usually you know it you know you've got a lot of time to review the, your answers before you submit the, you know your your finish the exam. Take the time, review the answers. You know, if when you're going through the exam, if you're not certain about an answer or a question, you can skip it and just come back to it later. Take the easy ones, do the ones you know, and then you can focus on the ones that you're less certain about. Or might need some math because we're asking about subnets. Yeah. You're also not penalized or penalized if you answer a question incorrectly. So there's never any reason to leave any of the or any of the questions unanswered. Again, for some reason people do. And hey, we, we do, we use something called psychometrics to make sure these exams are fair and, and uh, consistent between versions. And we factor in the, you know, 20% of guessing answers will possibly be correct, which is why if you get 20% of the questions right on the exam, you actually get the same score as if you got zero right. have a number of people spend a lot of time poring over these questions, as not just as we write them, but if anyone challenges, you know, the validity of some of the questions, we are constantly reviewing them. And just because you think there's no right answer there, it doesn't mean there isn't one. The other thing is proctors are not allowed to answer any questions about the content of the exam. And you know, this happens sometimes because, you know, you'll have a proctor who's technical as well. We're gonna play dumb and we won't interpret it for you. But please, you know, if you do think there is a problem with the exam, let us know. All right. All right. So once you're done the exam, uh, we'll get the results from view within 24 hours, and I think they promised 98.5% of the results will show up within 24 hours. Uh, probably over the last 15 years, we've had to ask them where one of the exam results were after three or four days, and the candidates wondering why they haven't received any, any emails or notice from us. Uh, but most of the time, you'll get, get an email from us within 24 hours, either congratulating you or Uh, so you'll get a score report. It'll tell you how well you did in the major areas, uh, as well as whether you passed or not. If you, does this one show it? Yeah. If you achieve the certification as well, you'll get a separate email telling you about that as well. Right. So the first 101 exam won't get you certified. You get the 102, and then you'll get the certification 
and they're, they're good for five years as well. They're, they're active for five years. We never expire them or delete them from the database. Uh, it's just after five years, if you haven't moved up a level or retaken the exam, which I'll get to the how to avoid that later, um, we just mark it inactive. The other thing is you don't have to take the exams in order. If you go and take the level two exams and you pass them, we don't award certification until you go and take the level one exams and pass those as well. And then we'll issue both at the same time. Um, quite frankly, it's most people are way more prepared for level two because that's where the fun stuff is. All right, I'll pick one, it's kind of like, you know, taking algebra and you know, boring subjects before you get to go build stuff, uh, you know, as an engineer. Although I didn't think was math was boring, but yeah, some people do. For all of our professional certifications, when it is awarded, we'll also mail out. So do make sure your registration has a real proper snail mail address. We'll mail out a congratulations letter, a full certification uh, paper that you can frame or laminate or you know, make into a t-shirt. I haven't seen that one yet. I'm sure they will. And we'll also give you a wallet sized card with, for that certification as well. If you don't receive it within a month, let us know. Double check your address and then let us know and we can always resend it. As well, you can also download a PDF version of it while you're waiting. Hmm. The other thing you'll notice if you go and check your certification online is there's some verification codes. So if you want to let your employer or friends, you know, see that you really do have that certification, you just have to let them know your LPI ID and one of those codes and they can see the certs that you have. And this is the URL to it, lpi.org slash verify. I believe if you just go slash your ID slash that code, so you can just put the URL and people don't have to enter it, it'll, it'll work as well as the form. So uh, we're gonna have to update this soon. So after five years, your certification's inactive. Um, we, you know, used to recommend recertifying every two and a half to three years or moving up a level, which is actually way better than just proving that you knew how to do, you still know how to do what you knew how to do three years ago. Um, but we actually are in the process of changing our member, our model for governance. So like the PMI, the Project Management Institute, if you know them, or the ISC2 that do the CISSP, Certification holders are the ones that are going to be the members of, or eligible to be members for the nonprofit, and they'll be the ones that get to vote for the board. Um, anyone could be a board member um, because we need more than just tech guys, and, you know, on a board uh, to make it functional. But it's the certification holders that get to choose them. Right. So, oh, hey. so. Uh, if you are, if any of you are certified and you don't want to retake the test, I'm in that boat. Uh, we will be using a more professional method for maintaining your credentials. Uh, we're just calling it that PDU system, professional development units. So it'll involve, you know, continue education, uh, work experience, whether it's, you know, for pay or volunteer work, uh, or, you know, contributing new knowledge to, to your field know, writing books, uh, blogs, articles online, um, as well as volunteer stuff, mentoring people, um, you know, study groups, helping organize study groups, things like that. Those things show that you're not only just actively using what you certified in, but like most professions, you're going beyond the certification, which is really just a minimum. Like this is the minimum you should know to really be a professional with these tools in this field. 
but you know, just like any other profession, whether it's a doctor or a lawyer, we expect you to go beyond that. Right? And so do your employers. It is a tough exam. A lot of people get offended when they don't pass. And usually it's because they've been using Linux for five or six or eight years. And they figure, yeah, I know all this stuff already. And they just wing it. And most of the time, that's not a good approach to taking the exams. So if you do fail an exam, you have to wait a week before you can take it again. And if you fail it a second time, you have to wait 90 days. Right. And then 90 days and 90 days. Because there are some guys that will try and just retake the exam over and over, you know, once a day, and they're just throwing their money away and then trying to brute force something that they just don't have the knowledge for yet. Right. So we try and slow people down from, you know, same sort of thing in a casino, right? We don't, we don't want your money. We want you guys to learn this stuff, and, and then we want to help you prove it to the world that you do know this. Right. Ah, so that's about it. Um, if you've got any questions, uh, we can answer them now. If you'd like to look at some of the details of the various certification exams, we can look through that, discuss some of the topics if, if you like, but otherwise, I'll let you guys go early. Um, I did bring some discount codes. So if anyone is interested in taking the exams before September of this year, uh, there's some 50% discount codes to basically just cover the hard costs of delivering the exams. Um, and get you guys right away. So don't forget to take some if, you, if you're interested. So any questions? So historically, um, we divided the wor that world into two sides, the skills assessment, the testing, and the training. And we don't do any training. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, the firewall that you, you don't cross, right? Because otherwise, there's a trust issue, right? We don't want people thinking that we're just doing this to get training revenue or something. And so, yeah, we're just the test. Now, that said, uh, there is that sort of middle ground, which is the learning materials, right? Uh, the courseware and things like that. Historically, we stayed away from that as well. Uh, we relied on partners, you know, whether it was O'Reilly or Cybex, Wiley, you name it, or commercial vendors that are doing you know, corporate training courseware. That worked the first decade, but we're now at the, you know, the tipping point where everybody realized, yeah, we got to learn this stuff. And so everybody's trying to set up education programs for this and having a lot of difficulty. So last year, the board changed the policy and we're now creating a base set of learning materials that will that'll be you know, free to use for any student that wants to. And then our partners as well would be able to use that in commercial settings. Um, and we're doing it that way so that you know, we have a relationship with the people that are using it for teaching others so that we can make sure they, they're aware of updates and things like that. Uh, if, you, if you go to learning.lpi.org, that's where we're going to be releasing that, that, those learning materials. The structure for them is, uh, remember there's 60 questions on the exam. So in the, actually let me just pop up a so you'll see it's broken down into some major topic areas and then they're further subdivided, right? So for instance, let's take this one, managing shared libraries. You'll see it's got a weighting of one. That means there's one question related to that topic area on each exam, right? And again, these are the things you should focus on while you're studying. You're welcome to learn more, but these are the things we'll be asking you about. And so for those learning materials, for each weight of the exam, we're going to write one lesson plan. Uh, it's structured very academically because a lot of it, this is actually uh, an exercise that's coming out of our academic advisory committee. And so each, each lesson plan is fairly standalone. Uh, there'll be about four or five pages of content 
and then another four or so pages of guided exercises. So questions and exercises with the answers. And then for anybody that gets past that, you know, so if they're in a school setting and some guy just runs off and gets it all done while everybody else is still working on it, there's then going to be another set of exercises without any answers, which we encourage everyone to do because honestly that's where you're going to do your most learning. Right. It's going off to look for answers that you just start accumulating side knowledge, which will come in handy later. Right. Does that answer your question? Sorry, that was a long answer. Yeah. Yeah, 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 tons of them. Yeah, that's, yeah, they, uh, we don't tell them how to structure their education programs. I mean, we sometimes help them set some up, but yeah, I mean, they, you know, however they, you know, that pedagogy word, you know, however they think they should set up their, their programs. Yeah, once in a while, uh, on our, on our exam development list, which last time I checked, and, you know, eight years ago, there was over a thousand guys, sorry, a thousand opinions uh, on that mailing list. You know, quite often they'll look at this and they'll say, hey, this is all out of order. You shouldn't be teaching it this way. And then we point out, this is not, the, this is not a teaching thing. This is just a list of what you need to know. And you structure it and order it any way you want. For instance, when, you know, I've, I've taught Linux classes, you know, in corporate settings and, you know, there's some lugs. And I usually leave the installation for last, right? Because that actually requires a lot of knowledge about the hard disk and partitions and formatting and file systems and you name it, that why do you start with, hey, let's install Linux, right? It's better to learn all the components and then the installation's easy, right? Not to mention, if you mess up your installation, you now spend the next two days <laughs> trying to figure out why you can't install Linux instead of actually learning all the content. Right? You know, I was about to make an improper joke about making a baby, but you know, it's not like it. So uh, we are actually, if any of you guys know this material well, we're constantly looking for more writers to help. Um, it is a paid gig. We do pay people for this. Um, and it's broken up in very chunkable bits, so people get to cherry pick what they what they teach. Um, and here's a sample, actually, of one of the lesson plans. They and it, we're still working on the the, the, you know, the the template and everything for it. Uh, but I'm told that a significant portion of it's going to be released sometime around June. Yeah. Um, but by the end of the year, we want to have full coverage for all of our exams. And then afterwards, we won't release a new certification or anything without this content as well. No. And, and we're starting with the lower level stuff first. So Linux Essentials, that's why this example is Linux Essentials. Linux Essentials and LPIC 1 we'll cover first, usually because that's the one that people need the most help with. All right? Quite often, LPIC 2 guys, they don't, they often don't go take courses. They just start learning it on their own because you know, they've bootstrapped their knowledge enough that they can deal with problems as they go, and usually, you know, Stack Exchange or, you know, Reddit or wherever, they can go and ask some questions, and there's lots of people that have. <laughs> Actually, I've learned that the best way to get an answer is to go on there and say, this sucks, and blah, 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 I can't even do this, and then people will go, yeah, you did this and this, whereas if you just go and say, hey, how do I do this? You know, uh, nobody wants to answer those questions, but if you piss them off, you get some answers. Yeah. That's not an official way to get help. But yeah. so any other questions, Mark? The, oh, my email address is not on there, but uh, if you do have some questions, you're welcome to email me. It's matt at lpi.org. Well, officially it's M-R-I-C-E, M-Rice at lpi.org. Um, I had that address before we established our email policy. I, I still got to keep the old one, just in case, you know, someone from 20 years ago wants to email me. Yeah. You never know, long lost friends. Yeah. Someone that went to, you know, or got what we call a good job uh, in consulting and, and stuff. Uh, you know, there's highs and lows, and so a good job stands for get out of debt. 
Yeah, so then you go back and be a consultant again after a few years, once your, your spouse has recovered. I hope I'm not triggering any nerves here. Was there anything from this presentation you were expecting that we didn't do? Quite often people come here wanting to, you know, thinking it's going to be a class. And there's just way too much to cover, even on Linux Essentials, to make that sort of exercise worthwhile. So usually we'll use this to try and help organize some study groups or things like that. Uh, through view, yeah. Actually, here, let's do a, a live demo of that. Go to view. And so, technically, view is our partner, right? They promise to deliver our exams everywhere they can, and then they set up the relationships with training centers and universities, military bases, you know, random hot dog vendors. You know. uh, oh, that's today. Yeah, well. So you can see the exams here, although they're also listed down here. Oops. Here, click on find a test center. Oh, okay, they really mean it. <laughs> All right. Um, there, there are test centers here, yeah. And, and actually, uh, if any of you are going to some of the universities here as well, uh, through the World Skills, do you guys know the World Skills competition? Um, they actually use our LPIC 2 as the basis for their Linux competition. I didn't know that until two years ago, but they've been doing it for a, a long time. And uh, we were actually talking to some of the universities here about helping them set up for that Linux competition. But, uh, well, you know, nonprofits are sometimes slow moving trains. <laughs> so uh, we'll, we'll get there. Um, but well, we're also, trying to, we're also trying to convince them to add some of the DevOps topics. The, you know, and so are some of the people in World Skills. You know, the tech guys are going, yeah, it's time to change this around a little bit. And hey, fortunately, we managed to, you know, match their zeitgeist and, and uh, you know, our, our DevOps certifications is what some of the people want to add topic from. So, but yeah, once, once this site's back up, I'd be surprised if there were fewer than five places in, in Singapore that you could take the test. Yeah. And regardless, um, we're talking to Mario, we're hoping that we'll be able to do some paper versions of the test here as well, right, and also help reduce the cost for people. All right, well in that case, what I'm going, I'll call it a day. And uh, I do have some uh, voucher codes for people if they, if they want a few additional ones that'll get them the the exams for half off. Um, I, I went really high tech and printed them out on a bunch of slips for everybody. So, so anyway, thank you very much. I, I actually appreciate everyone showing up. Uh, quite often this is voted the most boring presentation of any conference. But hey, you know, anything worth doing is worth doing in a boring way. Yeah. Oh my God. Anyway, you got that part of the video, right? Oh, nice. All right, thanks again, guys.